thank you, Lady Westmacott, for this. Can I hold it here? Is that all right? For this uh, very kind of nice event that you've uh, allowed us to have here and put on for us here. And I have, um, I'm most grateful to you, and I thank everybody for coming. Susie is quite right when she said da Dick's diary was um, um, Susie and a box, a cardboard box. And for five years I dusted the cardboard box because if you knew Richard Helms, you didn't dare ask him what was in the cardboard box. <laughs> and so when we were going to Tehran, I finally said to him, can you cope with the box? And he said, what box? And I said, the cardboard box. I've been dusting for years on the top shelf. And so he opened it, and the only thing in it was his white spats and his silk scarf for his evening clothes. And I had dusted it all those years thinking it was love letters from some wonderful, beautiful woman that I didn't know anything about. Anyway, I did not really intend to write this book. I had written a book on Iran, and um, in, in the, it came out in 81, I think. And then I tried to write this book and found it too difficult to do because I was much too close to some of the events, particularly the war and my divorce and other issues. And so I gave it up and put all the stuff away and uh, went to work. And then last November in, in uh, 2011, my grandchildren, actually my grown grandchildren, and particularly Lindsay's son, Rory, made me promise that I would do it. I had told them odd stories through the years and never anything really pieced together. And so he made me promise that I would do it. So in January, just exactly a year ago, I was lucky enough to find Chris, who is the ultimate person to work with. She is a complete professional, but she kept me focused. And she was fun, and we were joined at the hip for eight months, and we produced the whole thing in eight months. And so I am most grateful to Chris. Um, but that's how it all started. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lady Westmacott, for hosting this wonderful event. And thanks all of you for coming to celebrate a remarkable woman and her intriguing life. Um, I have long felt that the women of the greatest generation have not gotten their due. They have not gotten the attention or the credit that they deserved. And that's not to take anything away from the men. The men were extraordinarily patriotic, they were brave, they survived the depression, they fought a war, they uh, contributed to the baby boom after the war, but then <coughs> so did the women. And the women really haven't uh, gotten the um, attention, I think, uh, even though they were just as talented, just as patriotic, and just as important. Uh, Cynthia Helms has experienced up close and personal some of the momentous events of the 20th century and she's also known some of the most famous people of the 20th century. When we were working on this book, I often told her, I said, you're like Forrest Gump. You just <laughs> knew everybody. I mean, in this embassy, in fact, back in 1964, when the Beatles were here in their first tour of the United States, uh, there was a reception here, and she uh, found a sort of quiet spot for herself to get away from the crowd and found, found herself sitting next to Paul McCartney. Of course she did. Her life was like that. Uh, the most remarkable thing to me about her, though, is that she was not just a witness to history. She really lived it. She's lived an extraordinary life. And she has lived all the incredible changes that have taken place in the lives of girls and women in the last century. Uh, when she was born in, in, in Malden, England in 1923, little girls were expected to grow up and be wives and mothers, which was fine, but nothing else. Well, in the course of her life, things changed, and she changed too. I hope that this book helps contribute to younger women's understanding of what their mothers and grandmothers went through, and great-grandmothers for that matter, and that not to take for granted all that they have. She yearned all the time throughout her entire life to have a life of her own. That's the way she put it, a life of my own. And it really was about having her own unique identity that was not just as someone's mother or someone's wife, as much as she enjoyed being a mother to the four McKelvey children, some of whom are here today, and as much as she uh, enjoyed being Mrs. Richard Helms. She was more than that. And I think that comes through in this book, and that's an important thing, that every human being wants their own identity. We're going to begin today um, with our discussion with her service during World War II. 
Cynthia grew up on the southeast coast of England, which is the part of the island that is closest to the continent. And for the millennium, that part of England had been invaded by Vikings, by you name it. And was the people of Malden in that area were acutely aware of the Nazi threat, probably more aware than anyone else, because they knew, it was in their DNA, that they were vulnerable uh, to invaders. She enlisted in the Women's Royal Naval Service exactly as soon as she could, as soon as she turned 18 and she was legally eligible. So my first question is to tell us why did you enlist and what was sort of driving you as a teenager to become a member of the Women's Royal Naval Service? And tell us about being a boat crew wren, which is very special. Well, I was sent to the West Coast by my parents when war broke out. If you remember, the um, peace in our time was in 1938, and then war came in 1939. And our area was very vulnerable, as Chris says. And so uh, after a few months, my, uh, the, uh, you know, there was odd bombing, but not too much. But my, for the danger of invasion and things, my parents sent me to the West Coast to live with an elderly uncle who was a naval officer. And uh, so I lived with him, and he actually lost a son uh, in France when France collapsed. And his second son, who became second le sea lord, eventually committed suicide because he lost all his money in the um, financial crisis in, in England. But he, um, I lived with him for about a year, and he would set off on his bicycle in the morning looking for food because there was no food at that time anywhere. Sometimes he'd come back with a jar of marmalade, and sometimes he'd come back with nothing. But he was very strict, and I called my mother and said, Uncle Edward won't let me out at night. What's the problem? I'm, what's the problem with this? I have to be home. And she said, because he was such a naughty playboy when he was a child, he knows what can happen to young girls after dark. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> then he enlisted me to go to tea dances at the Imperial Hotel in Torquay, where the pilots it was been taken over for the um, rehabilitation of Air Force pilots, the burned pilots mostly from the Battle of Britain. And I was 17 and I went to a tea dance one day and I was leaning up against a ballroom rather like this. I was leaning up against the door <coughs> thinking, can I do this, can I do this? And I was looking at, at all these men and I, uh, with huge bandages and terrible disfiguration on them. And this one young man, I presumed he was young, was coming towards me and he had all these bandages on his hands and his arms and his head and his eyebrows had gone and he was looking at me and he held my eyes as he came towards me and I knew instinctively that he didn't want me to flinch when I looked at his face. So I made myself stand there and I danced with him. And I went home and said to my uncle, I'm going home. And he said, why? And I said, well, I have to go and join up. It's, you know, this is ridiculous. I'm going home. And this was um, in the middle of July when the Battle of Britain was going on. And I went home and um, said to my parents, I'm going to join up. And so there was a great discussion because my brother, who was uh, 19, who was two or three years older, he was 19 when he joined up, but he was an Air Force pilot and he was flying the dangerous missions of dropping agents into France and into Germany. They were flying at treetop level, you know, and dropping all the agents in. And uh, he, in the end, flew about 80 missions on this, and he got endless distinguished medals for it, and is now the only survivor of his squadron that lost in rotation 600 people. So it's amazing. I still talk to him in London every weekend. But I went to London. I told my parents I was going. There was much discussion about this, and my mother was not at all happy. But I got on a train and went to London, and I went to the naval office, the Women's Royal Naval Office, and I joined up and on my, about my 18th birthday. And I had waited two or three weeks to get my call-up papers, and then they sent me to... I had asked to go to Scotland, to the Fleet Air Arm, and of course, when you volunteer for something, you always go in the opposite direction. So they sent me to uh, Malvern Boys' School, which had been turned into a naval establishment, HMS Duke, and I was to work in an office there. So I arrived there, and I was assigned to a man called Richard Helms. I mean, should, not Richard Helms, excuse me, Richard Miles. And he since has become, he, you see his name in many books because he became a great friend of Mrs. Roosevelt's. 
he came over and trying to win support for the war. Anyway, I was sent to his office, and of course, I'm sure I was absolutely useless.